Romans 9. Last week, Romans 8, we covered, again, some heavy, heavy, heavy topics. Um, the idea of God choosing, who does he choose? Future glory, the earth is waiting for the glory of God to be revealed in us and it can't wait. Uh, we talked about the Holy Spirit bearing witness with us and making sure we know we are sons and daughters. We talked about God's love that nothing can separate us. I think twice in this chapter, Paul says, confidently believe this. I with all confidence believe this. I trust this. And we said last week, this is the confidence that we need to have. This is the confidence that we should live with. That legitimately, even when I can't see it, when I can't feel it, when I don't have anything to say, but I know I feel all these things, God is legitimately doing more than I could ever imagine behind the scenes. He's the best. Literally, he's the best. So, one big thing that we talked about was being heirs with Christ last week, and I love that so much. I think the Passion Translation said that all that Jesus has, I have in him. And again, where we like to go, you know, we like to sidestep, we will look at Jesus and we go, I can't be in Jesus. So then when I don't have all that Jesus has, I feel inadequate. I feel like I'm missing something when all I need to do is believe. And that was like the first what, five chapters of, of Romans was just all about, yo, nothing matters outside of your belief. That's all you need to do is believe. Jesus will do the rest. So here we are, chapter nine, and we are just going to jump in. He is continuing to talk about God's choice and God choosing. So he says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all blessed forever. Amen. So real quick, he's like, yo, I wish that I could just like not be part of this and that they, the Israelites, he's going to go into it, um, could just do this for real, for real. He's like from the beginning. Whew, I see you dog. Um, let's read it. Cause then it's better together. Verse six, it says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel and not all children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of work, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger as it is written, Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hate it. So let's break this down into English real fast. Basically, he's like, yo, God a long time ago chose the Israelites and he chose them starting with Abraham. And he goes, but the promise does not come just to those physical children of Abraham. It comes to the children of the promise, those who believe. That makes sense? So he's like, yes, God chose Abraham. He also chose uh, Jacob over Esau. They were twins in the womb. They were twins. And so he's making the point. God did not choose based on their good works or their bad works or what they had done or what they hadn't done or anything. 
God chose Jacob in the womb. And what's crazy is because they're twins, if God chooses Esau, his twin brother, guess what? Then they're all the children of Esau instead of Jacob, whose name was then changed to Israel. And so he just says God chooses because he chooses not based on anything that we have done or cannot do or whatever. Like God chose. He chose the Israelites as a people, but he goes further than that and says the promise is not just for the physical children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That makes sense. OK. Verse 14, it says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. This question, when you look at different versions, it says, is this to say that God is unfair in who he chooses? Is God unjust? Is he unfair in when he chooses who he chooses? And he says, by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and hardens and he hardens whomever he wills. There's a key on verse 17. Everybody see that key on verse 17 with a study Bible. There's a huge chunk on the bottom of that that breaks this scripture down for us. And it says, Paul cited the example of Pharaoh in answering the question, is there injustice on God's part? By reason of his sovereignty over mankind, God claims and exercises his right to dispense his mercy as he sees fit. He did so in the case of Pharaoh. God said, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. In Exodus chapter four, verse 21. As a result, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them. Exodus 7:13. The scriptures also declare, however, and this is important to know, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart in Exodus chapter 8, verse 15, 32, and then chapter 9, verse 34. Pharaoh's attitude was, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Pharaoh was not beyond the help of God's mercy, nor had God made him wicked. God merely left him to his own wickedness. Does that make sense? God left him to his own wickedness. In ancient Egypt, the pharaohs were regarded as gods. The pharaoh who ruled during the time of Moses seemed to have thought of himself as a deity capable of resisting the Lord. God exalted himself by his mighty judgments upon Egypt and his deliverance of Israel. As a result, even the Philistines and Canaan knew about these judgments and feared God. So does that make that scripture a little bit easier to understand? Not necessarily that God is making people evil for the sake of making them evil. You have some Christians who'd be like, yeah, God makes people evil. Like Wuhan, Luhan, like, dang, that is not okay to say, bro. Like, I hate that so much, but it's like the most clear cut example that I have of actual people saying that out loud. Yeah. So God is not he did not make her. He did not make whoever political, whatever political person you think or see for the sake of evil. He allows them because he is God to stay where they are. So then further, it is our job as Christians to go and love these people and pray for these people. That is why the scripture says, and we'll see it in four weeks, pray for your leaders. Chapter 13 of Romans. We'll see that four weeks. Legitimately, it's in there. But this is why we pray for them. Because if they see themselves as X, Y, and Z, what is the only saving grace that they have? Jesus. Jesus intervening legitimately. So it is up to us to then do our part 
with God for the sake of their salvation. Because as we know, nobody is past or beyond the grace of God. We read that chapter five or six, whichever it was. But that the more sin that there is, the more that grace abounds. So nobody is past the grace of God. Nobody. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. Nobody is. Pharaoh himself stuck to his own wickedness. He still chose. I was having a conversation with somebody about Judas. Was it you? I don't know. It was about Judas. And it was like, people will say, oh, God made Judas to turn Jesus over or to sell Jesus out. No, Judas was a human being who had greed in his heart and God did not take the greed away. And so because of that greed, there was a little bit of sin opening. Satan slips in and Jesus knows that and says, go and do what it is you are going to do. Crazy part is Jesus also made him treasurer. You know what I'm saying? You'd be like, Jesus, if you know that he was going to do that, why would you make him treasurer? That was my Kevin Hart voice. Um, <laughs> Jesus, if you know that, why would you make him treasurer? You know, but he made him treasurer. Judas is actually is also the same one who when Mary comes and washes Jesus's feet, he's the one who all of a sudden is so holy and righteous and is like, yo, <laughs> She, she's spilling this perfume. She's wasting it. We could have sold that. Judas missed the whole point. <laughs> he was like, we could have got some money. Which in that passage, it actually does talk about how Judas actually would skin from the money well before he betrayed Jesus. Boom. Um, it's like in, the, like, they, yeah. in that passage, they literally like talk about how Judas would like, mm -hmm. take off the top. Yes. He was already that's crazy. And Jesus still, Jesus still made him treasure. And he, we just ready to chop heads off, you know, like, dang, hey, you ain't going to run my money anyway. So those people that we know that we see, like, you know, in public, King Herod kills all the babies when Jesus is born. It's not that God says, hey, King Herod, go kill the babies. No, he doesn't. God is not, that's not what he is about, but he will allow, if you want your wickedness, he will allow you to have it. I chuckled because I thought about Nicole Kidman hugging Oscar the Grouch, the meme. So if you want it, he will let you have it. That makes sense? Okay, so verse 19, he says, you will say to me then, why does he, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? And then he turns it back on us and he says, but who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. I want to read this in the Passion Translation. Because it's a really good question in better English. <laughs> yes. Where it says that he has endured as much patience, best of the best of the is it saying like he put up with certain people so that he could get to the, with the end for the means? Or mm -hmm. the yeah. And I'm, a, yeah. The Passion Translation is, yeah, it's that. Verse 19, he says, well, then one might ask if God is in complete control, how could he blame us for who can resist whatever he wants done? Verse 20. But who do you think you are to second guess God? How could a human being molded out of clay say to want to the one who molded him? Why in the world did you make me this way? Or are you denying the right of the potter to make out of clay whatever he wants? Doesn't the potter have the right to make the same lump of clay an elegant vase or an ordinary pot? Yeah. 
Yes. You made a big tower? That's what's up. Keep making those towers. And in the same way, although God has every right to unleash his anger and demonstrate his power, yet he is extremely patient with those who deserve wrath, vessels prepared for destruction. And doesn't he also have the right to release the revelation of the wealth of his glory to the vessels of to his vessels of mercy, whom God prepared beforehand to receive his glory? That make more sense when we read that. So he says it is his choice. I saw something yesterday that said we we feel that we need to understand before we obey. And understanding is not a requirement of obedience. And that is one thing that we deal with the most. Why does God do this? Why did God do this? Why, why, why? If you want to hang out there and I go, it is not wrong to ask that question. But if my motive first is why God, I would dare you to go look at the back half of the book of Job. We all know the story of Job. Everything is taken away from him. He's on his deathbed. His friends are like, bruh, just give up the ghost, man. Curse God and die. And so then Job starts to speak up and ask these questions. He begins to challenge the potter. And you know what God says to Job? Stand up. Clean your face. Put on some clean clothes. I have questions for you. And he says, where were you when the foundations of the earth were created? Where were you when I put the whales in the ocean? Where were you when I gave the lion its roar? Where were you, Job? And legitimately, it's not like six questions. It's like a whole two chapters (laughs) of questions that God is asking Job. Exactly. Job's just like, uh, 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 because when um, I, um, and, and you and you and uh. <laughs> Y'all seen that video? It's like when your mom come home and you didn't put the chicken in the sink yes. like she told you. Well, because when you, um, um, because when I, um, because I went. That was Job. <laughs> but I go up until that point, Job was like, why, God? Why? Why did you do this? Why this? Why that? And we go, we all know the answer beforehand. God said, I trust him. God said, bro, I trust you more than anybody else. Satan himself. Satan came to me and I said that one because that one is my man. That's my dude. So when it comes to his choice, going back to chapter seven, first half of chapter seven or chapter eight, sorry. All of these things that Jesus has is ours as long as we suffer with him. As long as we suffer with him. So the moment and I go, it's not again, it is not bad to sit here and go, why, Lord? It's not because I don't want you to get into a place where you're not talking to God in the moments of despair. Please talk to him. But when my motive is I'm going to get answers from you, Jesus. If my heart says why, because I'm the clay and you're the potter, so I need you to know I don't like red paint on me. He says, who are you to talk back to the potter? And again, because we like to go to these extremes, like we are Fox News or CNN. We're like, oh man, that's God now. So now I can never talk to him. And we run to the other side. Guys, don't run to the other side of this. I go, every parent in here knows what it is like to have to be stern with a child. And because I am stern with a child does not mean that I don't love them. It does not mean that I don't care for them. It does not mean that I just want them to be punished. 
That's not what it means. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. So when I tell my two-year-old son, hey, who are you talking to? It's not because I don't want my son to speak up and voice himself. It's because I told you to sit down and eat your breakfast and you're jumping on the couch, webbing me as you jump off the couch. <laughs> and then you're like, why do I have to eat my breakfast, dad? Like, and so we see it from this completely different view. And then we take what we see and where we are and we run with it in a much different direction. And we're like, well, God, well, God, and so then our feelings are hurt and we aren't talking to him and we aren't in relationship. And he's just like, yo, I'm just trying to be the greatest dad of all time for all time. I think like thinking about the breakfast, Trey doesn't want to do that because all that's in his head is like, I want to jump on this couch. But it's like, you know that he's going to like really be affected later if he doesn't eat his breakfast. Like but this morning. That's why he was crying so much. He didn't eat his breakfast today. It's like best for him. So like, it's really hard for me like these verses, but I have to trust that like, that's yes. the best father. Yes. And that like, he's truly looking out for me. Yes. And that even when I don't want to do things that he's asking, because mm -hmm. it sounds way more fun to jump on the couch, like he wants to So like, there's two parts to this. Right, know, like, right. Your flesh is like, oh, but that like really hurts. Yes. Like, knowing that like, he has the actual best, like is really the only way I find comfort. Yes. And I go, and that's the beauty of it. We are all there. I said it last week. Our, our Christian struggles are not like, oh yeah, I just, I have a struggle. No, I don't want to be obedient. So then I put Christian words on it. I glitter it up. I have my cross so everybody can see it. It's got my Bluetooth speaker. It's got like glitter. I painted it. It's got my name on it, Junior into his house. It's your boy, you know, across the thing. Like, your boy is here. I got my cross and I'm like, you guys, I've been struggling. And everybody's like, I know, Rafer, I see your cross. <laughs> I can see it. I can see your cross. I'll pray for your struggle. It's not a struggle to carry a cross. I got a Bluetooth speaker on it. It's a, it's a cross of suffering. It's a cross of sacrifice. It's a cross of like things that I don't want to do and things I don't want to walk in. Literally crucify yourself daily. And we're sitting here going, oh, I have to take my speaker off. Well, that's not fair. God, why are you choosing that? Why are you telling me to let go of this? We do, we look like Nicole Kidman hugging Oscar the Grouch. I want this, Lord. And then we show up and we say, I'm struggling, guys. I'm only struggling where I don't want to be obedient because that's all he's calling me to. He's legitimately not calling me to like be this crazy, holy person. We put that way up there and then we're like, well, I can't do it. And then we blame God because we're like, well, he's the potter and I'm the clay. So what can I do? Trust and believe. Trust and believe. It is. It's two parts to this. God is in it with me. I have to be obedient and it is my choice to be obedient. And then I get mad when I'm not obedient and whatever comes with my disobedience, wages of sin is death. Then I get mad at God and then I walk away from church and then I'm like, nobody understands and da, 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 da. And then we just go down this path. And we stay stuck, man. We stay stuck. I don't want us to stay stuck. I go, because of the father that I know God is, my biggest challenge, hands down, outside of being a godly husband to my wife is being a representation of God the Father to my son. So because I know that I have to be stern with him, also I have to be aware of the fact that he can come and talk to me when he needs to talk to me. Yeah. I have to learn that balance of both sides as a father. 
So I'm learning both sides of my heavenly father while also learning both sides as a father. That's crazy. And so if I stay stuck in, well, God, then guess what? I now speak to myself what I'm going to be to him and what I'm going to be to Brooklyn. And that's not fair. That's not okay. And what does that come back to? That comes back to me and Jesus has nothing to do with him. It has nothing to do with him because he is going to be who he is. It has nothing to do with him. That's crazy. Where do we stop? That's good stuff. Oh, verse 25. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not my beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Basically, everybody who wasn't chosen as an Israelite, guess what? God still has an open door policy. So going back to chapter eight, when we talked about predestination, who God chose, who he didn't, we broke that down, predestined to live in the image of Christ, to be formed in the image of Christ. That what that whole phrase is, predestined to bear and be formed in the image of Christ. The standard was set, be like Jesus. So here he's saying, yo, all the people who were not initially chosen physically by the Israelites or through the bloodline of the Israelites, those people will be my people. So everybody here, is anybody an Israelite by blood? I did the DNA thing, no shot. <laughs> when I sent it off, I was like, two things, Lord, let me be related to Alexander Hamilton or Jesus. <laughs> like, that's it. Yes. I eat dinner. I didn't eat my breakfast. You didn't eat your breakfast. Thank you for confessing your sins. Good job. Jets, jets, jets. Jets, jets, jets. All right. Go sit down. Thank you, son. Thank you, son. I don't know if y'all know this, but he is a perfect mix of Jenny and I. It frustrates both of us. We're like, why are you so personable all the time? All the time, you know? If it's not her personality, it's my personality. And we're just here, excited, doing things right now. Verse 27, it says, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And, Isaiah, and as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us, left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness and have attained it, that is a righteousness that is by the faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Let me read that. Go ahead. 30 or 29 through 30 through 31, 33. I'm going to read that again in the Passion Translation. 29. Just as, I, just as Isaiah saw it coming and prophesied, if the Lord God of angel armies had not left us a remnant, we would have been destroyed like Sodom and left desolate like Gomorrah. So then what does this, what does all this mean? Here's the irony. The non-Jewish people who weren't even pursuing righteousness were the ones who seized it. A perfect righteousness that is transferred by faith. Yet Israel, even though pursuing a legal righteousness, did not attain to it. And why was that? Because they did not pursue the path of faith, but instead or insisted on pursuing righteousness by works, as if it could be seized another way. 
They were offended by the means of obtaining it and stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, be careful. I am setting in Zion a stone that will cause people to stumble, a rock of offense that will make them fall. But believers in him will not experience shame. I want to take some time to do some biblical flipping. So let's go to the bottom of page 1309, the end of chapter nine. We're on it right now. Israel's unbelief. Verse 33 has an X next to behold, I am laying a stone in Zion. There's a small X there. So we'll go to our middle column and we'll go down till we see 33. And so there's an X that says 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Y'all see that in the middle? Further, when we go further into the verse, or it says cite it from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. So if you want to go back and look at where that is written, because this is the one place he did not say where it was written. He just says, as it is written, this is where you would find where it is written. So there's the X and it says cited from Isaiah 28 and 16. Further, it says before a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, there's a letter Y. And in that same column, still under verse 33, there's a Y that says Isaiah chapter eight, verse 14. So what's cool about this is when we get into Bible study, when we start studying our Bibles, we can write those scriptures down and then we can go to Isaiah and not just read chapter eight, verse 14, but we can read ahead of it. We can read after it and get the entire picture of what is being said. That's a like that is such a solid tool for the study bag. Being able to go to Isaiah and not just read and go, oh, I found chapter eight, verse 14, or I found that it cited Isaiah 28, 16. I can read the entire message. And that's when you start going a little not crazy, but like that's what we call cross referencing scripture. And when we do that again, it broadens the message that I am reading. Just like when we look up the words in the back of the Bible, it broadens what I'm reading. It puts some meat on the bones. It gives some flesh to it. That makes sense? Okay. And then Z, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so then we still see when we come down into our middle column, there's a Z that says chapter 10, verse 11. When it does not have a book in front of it and it just says chapter 10, verse 11, that means the book you're in. So it's not going to say like if you're in Romans, it's not going to say Romans chapter 10. You're already in Romans. So it'll just say chapter 10, verse 11. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Let us go. We've been doing this for like 30 minutes. What's my live say? I don't know. I don't know. My live don't even have time on it. Dang it. Let's go to Isaiah real quick. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. It is in the Old Testament. Page 801, 801. Actually, let's do page 802 because we'll start at verse 14. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14 on page 802. 
So when you flip the page back to 801, at the beginning of chapter 28, it says judgment on Ephraim and Jerusalem. Judgment on Ephraim and Jerusalem. Ephraim is one of the tribes of Israel. So I don't know what happened before this, but we get to chapter 28. There is judgment that's about to come down. As you read through chapter 28 and you get to verse 14, there's a header that says a cornerstone in Zion. So let's read. Oh, this is going to be good. Let's read. And this is when we're about to go a little crazy in using our Bibles, because there's a key here and the key says go to Psalms. So we're going to do that. So a cornerstone in Zion, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who ruled this people in Jerusalem, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol. We have an agreement when the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us for we have made lies. We have made lies our refuge and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and water will overwhelm the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it passes through, it will take you for morning by morning. It will pass through by day and night and it will be sheer terror to understand the message for the bed is too short to stretch on to stretch oneself on and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself in. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Parazim, as in the Valley of Gibeon, he will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed and to work his work. Alien is his work. <laughs> now, therefore, do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. Give ear and hear my voice. Give attention and hear my speech. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground? When he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter dill, soak cumin, and put in wheat in rows and barley in its proper place and immer as the border? For he is rightly instructed. His God teaches him. Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over cumin, but dill is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. So he says here, yo, you have set up lies as a foundation, and essentially, I'm about to shut all that down. <laughs> I'm shutting all that down. And over and over and over until it's gone, I'm beating it out. And then he goes into some strict farming techniques that I was like, mm, don't get this. But he goes, yo, all these things don't happen continually. Because God said that I am going to kill the lies and tear down until it's done does not mean again, like we just read, I'm a good father. I'm not here to just crush your soul for the sake of crushing your soul. My discipline will be my discipline and my love will be my love. I think the coolest part about this whole cornerstone and the stumble and it being a stumbling block, the cornerstone itself is Jesus. And the only reason people stumbled was because they didn't believe in him and the truth tripped them up. The truth made them stumble. I'm living my life skating on the land of sin and death, having a good time. And then here comes some Jesus truth. And I'm like, ooh, 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 you know, like Marv Home Alone 2 with the paint. 
It's one of my favorite parts of one of my favorite movies. You know? So let's go to this key. Verse 16, at the bottom of page 802, it says, See the note on Psalm 118.22 concerning the cornerstone. So Psalm 118, we're going closer to the front of the Bible. On page 691. Page 691. Dang, this is tight. So Psalm 118, verse 22. And I just want to let you know, we are now on, like, we are twice removed from Romans in a Bible treasure hunt. How cool is this? So it says the stone, verse 22, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. We see that there is a key there. So let's read the key on the bottom. It says Jesus used Psalm 118, 22 to explain why the Jewish leaders had rejected him in Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. So then if you're like, oh, I want to read this story later, you write that one down. Matthew 21, 42. It says Peter explained that Jesus Christ was the cornerstone in Acts and in 1 Peter. Paul described the Jews as tripping over the stumbling stone and not understanding the truth that righteousness is by faith, not works. Romans chapter 9, verses 31 through 33. Boom! How tight is that? It just came like full circle. It says, also, Isaiah also used the imagery of a stone, Isaiah 8, 14, and 28, 16. We just read that. Uh-oh, see the note on Psalm 22, 1 through 31, concerning the Messianic Psalms. We are not going to go there, but it's really cool when you go and you look up those Messianic Psalms. Basically, it's like Psalms that were written by David and then Jesus used them and applied them to himself. And it's really cool. Like, it's like there's a bunch of them in Psalms. But if you want to go read that, write that one down and go look at that later. So the stumbling stone, Romans 9. This is good stuff, man. We'll go back to Romans 9. To close out. <clears throat> so Romans 9. God and his choice. Remembering that God is not choosing bad for us. I go, when you take this chapter outside of the entire book, we miss the part about suffering with Christ. You know what I'm saying? So I go, so you have to, in reading this, because remember, it's a letter. The only reason we have chapters and verses is because somebody was like, let's make this easier to reference. That's it. So Paul is just like writing this. That's why when we start chapter 10, technically chapter 10 starts with the end of what he's saying in chapter nine. So like it's going to be a bridge for us next week as we finish what he's saying and then he starts a new thought process. So remember, it's a letter that he's just writing out. He's just sitting there writing forever. This is a lot to write. So we need chapter eight to know what chapter nine is actually saying. That as long as I choose Jesus, yes, suffering is coming. But as long as I know in him, this suffering is coming. Guess what? All that he has is all that I have. And because all that he has is all that I have. I am okay being molded by the potter. Yeah. And just like every single piece of pottery, every piece has some imp imperfections. Now, those imperfections are not made by God. Those imperfections are given to us when we are born into sin. 
and God has us on the wheel and he's just trying to smooth those rough edges out. And we're like, no, Jesus is my beauty mark. Like, <laughs> you're like, no, nope, no, nah, it doesn't count. Mm -mm. But remembering that God is not out to get me. God is not out to make sure that I am like, you know, this thing that I cannot attain by myself. He is a very good father. And if I feel like I'm having a hard time, if I feel like I'm tripling over, if I'm tripping over the stumbling block, or like it says, a rock of offense. I heard a preacher say one time, I think it was Robert Madu. He said, you've never been offended until you've been offended by Jesus. And I was like, bro, that's the truth. He said, Jesus will have you mad at him. Because he was like, yo, and you was like, excuse me, Jesus? <laughs> what? And so if I feel that I am stumbling, I'm only stumbling over the truth. That makes sense? Because it says the Israelites who didn't believe, they were stumbling. They didn't believe. And so if I'm not believing like the Israelites and I feel like I'm not getting it, that's because I'm stumbling over what I know the truth is. Come back to belief. Come back to righteousness. Come back to him. Because the moment that I do, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. He will not be put to shame. We see shame as suffering. And it's not the same thing. We go, oh, well, I'm suffering. So I guess I'm being, no, 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 no. Be, you will not be put to shame. So when you do suffer, guess what? Somebody's going to see your countenance. Somebody's going to see your attitude. Somebody's going to see that you have something different as you go through whatever the thing is. How is it that X, Y, and Z are happening to you? And you're just like, people will see that and God will allow people to see that. You will not be put to shame. Your father will not allow you to be put to shame. I need you to know that if you believe, you will not be put to shame. That's how good he is. Any questions, any comments, any concerns? Yes, go ahead. Zootopia, nice. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, we're gonna go into the holy place. Uh, spend some time with Jesus. Um, before we go, I do want to say, um, I want us to, we are over halfway through Romans now. And I'm gonna send a text out to everybody. I wanna challenge everyone to read ahead. From here on out, look up some words, do some cross-referencing, and not that I'm going to go around the room and like, hey, Keisha, what'd you get this week? That is not what I plan to do at all, but so that we can have more discussion, read ahead a little bit. So read chapter 10 this week. Um, yeah, and then just start, you know, look up some words, maybe see what jumps out. Maybe you read it two or three times and you're just like, man, I just can't get belief out of my head or whatever the case may be. Then say that when we get here. But that is my prayer that next week through this week that I wanna challenge everyone to start using this on your own and then when we get here we'll still walk through things next week that make sense cool facebook love y'all y'all have fun don't let the bed bugs bite we'll see y'all on the flip